I'm so glad you're visiting us. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. We're here to make disciples who go make other disciples. People who are rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus. Calvary Chapel is a great place to worship and grow. We are so glad you're here. Father, we ask you to please just let that truth settle down in our hearts of how great you are, how much greater you are than our grief, our fears, our worries, our struggles, the hardships we face the questions we have you're greater than all those things you're greater than any of the obstacles that we face any of the things that the enemy puts in front of us or trips us up with you're greater than all those things like the Bible says you're greater than our hearts even how great you are and Lord, in those moments when we find ourselves depressed, looking at our world and focusing on the chaos and the confusion and all the arguments and disagreements and strong opinions and decisions made, made by others many times, the consequences of which we have to also face or when we look at all these things help us to remember how great you are help us to f fix our eyes fix our hearts on your greatness this morning as we open the scriptures together as we consider the things that were written for our instruction and our correction, our reproof, our training. Help us to remember how great you are. To really humble ourselves in your presence and remember that we're not all that. You're the great one. You're the holy one. There's no one like you. We need you, we need your power, we need your mercy, your grace, we, we need your instruction. We need your love. And Father, I'm just so grateful that you called me out of darkness and the chaos and the confusion you washed me you continue to wash me and father there's some here who need very very much need you to just wash over them with your love with that pure holy cleansing transforming consoling, comforting love. We thank you for the, the blessing, the privilege of gathering together. And we thank you so much for joining us here. Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you be seated? You know, one of the reasons that I remain convinced that preaching and teaching 
verse by verse through the Bible is the wisest approach for us here at Calvary Chapel, Miami Beach, is passages like the one we're going to be dealing with today. Um, It's definitely not my favorite passage to teach from the Bible. Uh, To be honest, I'd probably be tempted to avoid it altogether if my approach to teaching was topical rather than expositional. If we didn't go through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, I'd probably just kind of leave this one out and talk about something else. Um, But that is the way we do it. It is just kind of right here next in line for us. And uh, and so we're going to We're going to get to it in just a second, but it's one that quickly becomes uncomfortable for us. So I I want to preface everything we're about to read, everything I'm about to say with one verse from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 tells us, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, quick quick little lesson on that verse, because that's one we, we love to hold on to, as we should... But we need to recognize what he says in that passage. He says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not just about being in church, right? In Christ Jesus. And who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, in another place in in that same area of scripture, the apostle Paul tells us that those who are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. In other words, Again, it, there's, there's something there that, that he wants us to, to recognize that those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are um, children of God, sons and daughters of the living God, the evidence of that is going to be that, that they're not being led around by their own fleshly appetites and desires. They're not being governed by their human soul, mind, will, and emotions. Instead, they're led by, governed by, directed by the Spirit of almighty God. And he says, if that's what's going on in your life, well, then everything that's passed, it's gone. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And and that's just, you know, extremely important for us to begin with today, because I doubt that I've ever met even one person, male or female, who isn't guilty of what we're about to dig into. So here we go. Matthew 5, Verses 27 to 32, Jesus taught this. Again, we're still in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery now we're going to stop right there and just dig into this that's more than enough for us to talk about today you know I I knew a lady many many years ago who was really tormented by this passage of scripture she was divorced and she was convinced that God hated her because she was divorced she interpreted this teaching from the Lord Jesus to mean that because she was divorced She was going to go to hell when she died. That is not what he said. Divorce, adultery, these are not unforgivable sins. But neither are they insignificant or trivial. You know, we live in a a time, in a culture where marriage is being trivialized. It's this whole thing of adultery, divorce, all that stuff. It's just, eh, we wink at it. And it's as if we've come to the conclusion that God winks at it, but he doesn't. You know, his standards have not changed with the times. Why not? Well, because his plan for humanity is perfect. It didn't need to change. 
His plan for humanity is flawless. The problem is we're not, right? We're messed up. But God doesn't change his plan to make allowances for our flaws and imperfections. In in, in other words, he doesn't compromise because we always do. Instead, he he shines his light and 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 he's merciful and he gives us grace. He, He helps us is what that means. Gives us power to make good choices. But, but we need to understand his intentions and his views in this area of marriage and, and adultery. You know, I, I pretty regularly hear some celebrity m- make a statement like, y- y- monogamy is unnatural. I, I mean, people, human beings just aren't built for monogamous relationships, relationships where, where you commit yourself to life, you know, one man to one woman forever. That's just unreasonable. And I understand that conclusion because, y- you see... <laughs> The natural human being, the natural man, is never satisfied. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Now, that's a good bathroom mirror verse, by the way. You know what I mean? Print that one out and like tape it to your bathroom mirror. Because it kind of puts things into perspective. It's part of our nature to never be satisfied. But if that's true, I mean, if it's natural to never be satisfied, why did God establish a social structure for us within which the family's foundational? Why did he say that one man should be joined to one woman for a lifetime if it's natural for people to become dissatisfied with each other after a period of time? Well, look again at what that proverb says. Put it back up there for me if you would, Maria. Hell and destruction are never full. There's always room for one more, right? Always time for one more life to be destroyed. So, the eyes of man are never satisfied. You see what it's saying? You see what God is saying to us right there? If The implication is clear. I mean, if you make it your focus to gratify yourself, satisfy yourself, I just want to be happy, I just want to be satisfied, I just... Well, go for it. That is a surefire way to destroy your life and the lives of people around you. Just focus on that. I've said it before so many times, you know, I, I, and I'm always on touchy ground because people always misunderstand me. I love the United States of America. I love our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, our, you know, but, but here's the thing. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, yes, you have a right to those things, but the pursuit of happiness will wreck you. If you make that a pursuit, hell and destruction await you. You see what, based on that proverb, if that's a focus, if that's a pursuit, if that's what you fix your eyes on, you're never going to get there because the eyes of man are never satisfied. The pursuit of pleasure is a problem for most Americans. It's a problem. I mean, could could it be that there's more to God's plan, more to his design than we can see by merely focusing on fulfilling the desires of our flawed human natures? Of course there is. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? We know that God has bigger plans. He has better plans. He values and therefore prioritizes intimacy, oneness in relationship above short-term physical and emotional pleasure or satisfaction. He has, he has much better things for us than the short-term pleasures, the pursuit, pursuits of happiness and pleasure. You know, Elizabeth, my wife and I participated last week in an extravagant event over at the Ritz-Carlton in Naples. We, we were laughing. Everybody involved was kind of laughing about it because it was a missions conference. I mean, check that out. A missions conference at the Ritz-Carlton in Naples. And they had this guy, he's a Christian comedian um, that emceed the thing all weekend long. And he he started right off the bat, he started joking about it. It's like, yep, this is the way missionaries live all the time. Didn't you know? I mean, Naples, Florida, sun, sand, palm trees, the Ritz Carlton, chocolate on your pillows, whatever you want to eat, anytime you want to eat it, this is missions. Everybody knew that wasn't true. Well, then why were we there? 
Well, because they, they had gathered together some of the wealthiest Christian business people in the United States for the purpose of speaking into their lives, encouraging them and, and, and ministering to them, praying for them, but also challenging them and giving them the opportunity to put their wealth to work for the kingdom, to train and send missionaries all over the world. Now, it, everybody knew, you know, it wasn't one of those bait and switch kind of things where, you know, free weekend at the Ritz Carlton, but then you got to listen to a 90 minute presentation on missions. Everybody knew the whole weekend was about missions. I mean, we had, we had some of the best food and, and it, you know, it was like an abundance of food. We had wonderful speakers. Uh, Lee Strobel was one of them that spoke, you know, the guy that wrote Case for Christ, Case for Faith, you know, these kind of things. He was, um, I, I usually expect Christian authors to not necessarily be such good speakers, but Lee Strobel's a good speaker as well as a, a, a good writer. And the whole weekend was filled with worship and hearing from missionaries, hearing their stories, hearing, uh, you know, just these remarkable testimonies. I mean, it was, it was a, a great weekend in a, in a great venue and, and we did we joked about how easy it would be to get used to the treatment that we were receiving there right I mean it's nice to have somebody come in every afternoon and turn down your bed for you and put a little chocolate on the pillow I've keep, been asking Elizabeth where's my chocolate man it's like every night I, there's no chocolate on my pillow when we go to bed <laughs> but you know what I found even we enjoyed the food, we enjoyed the fellowship, we enjoyed the music, we enjoyed the teaching, we enjoyed the beach and the golf, you know, and all these different things. But the thing that struck me was that everybody there wanted something more. Everybody there wanted connection. And it was so interesting to watch because these people did not know each other by and large. You understand? These business people, these wealthy individuals who were brought in from different places did not know each other. There were some from Minnesota, there were some from Pennsylvania, some from California, from Colorado, from Kansas. I mean, just all over the country. And they flew in for this, not knowing each other for the most part. I mean, there were a few who, who knew each other. But by and large, people didn't know each other. And we had assigned seating. Elizabeth and I, one of the reasons we were there was, was that we spoke briefly, but we, we also were assigned a table so that we would like be table hosts you know it was our job to make sure everybody was talking and connecting and it was the easiest job in the world that part because people wanted the connection it was so interesting to me you know I'm not most of you already know if you've been here a while I'm not a real outgoing people person I'm not the guy to be a table host you know but I, I told him I'm like my wife she's an expert at this so I'll just sit back and watch her work, it'll be fun. And, and it was, but the, th the thing that struck us was that, you know, we would start at eight o'clock in the morning with breakfast. And then after breakfast, we'd be ushered in and there'd be a, the, the morning session where we would have worship and then there'd be a couple of speakers and that kind of thing. And then we'd be taken out, you know, ushered out to, to lunch. And, and, and after lunch, there was free time where you could go play golf or you could go to the beach or you could go to the pool, you could do pretty much whatever. And people would linger. These people who didn't know each other would be so engaged around the table that they weren't rushing to leave. In the evening, same kind of deal. You know, we, we had the free time, but then we had to be back for, for dinner and, and there was assigned seating. Now, do you understand? There was nobody policing the people, the participants, to come to dinner on time. But almost nobody was late. Now, granted, the food was incredible, so that had something to do with it, I'm sure. But everybody would sit down around the table and then we'd have to rush in, you know, at, at, well, not really rush, but seven o'clock to go in for the evening speaker. And it was always so good in the evening, you know, you knew kind of what it was going to be. At the end of it, they would have a dessert time. And again, we, we were mingling and people would just hang out. I didn't get to bed till like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. I was starting at seven in the morning. It was like, boom, boom, boom. And you know what I thought about? Sunday mornings because see what I see I mean you know from this perspective on Sunday morning we, we, we do a service everybody's together and then some of you guys man you're like a rocket out the back door boom you can't wait to get out of here you got places to go and people to see I don't know what you headed out of here for some incredible restaurant you found or 
you know, beautiful day at the beach. Now, some of you, granted, the cafe is usually full. So some of you stick around, some of you linger and connect. But it so struck me, these people don't even know each other. But they want to connect in Jesus. They want the connection. They want the intimacy of relationship. We're made for it. And, and as the leaders of this event, as we all gathered together to you know, discuss and process the results afterward, we were all impacted by the sense of family we felt. That people who didn't know each other on Thursday were so connected that they wanted to keep in touch by Sunday morning. I came away from there with, you know, two realizations. One, I'm super grateful for the iPhone. I can take a picture of a business card and I don't fill up my pocket with them. And number two, I need to get some business cards because <laughs> I don't use them most of the time. But there were so many people that we made connections with. People of like interest. For the most part, it was centered around Jesus. There was one guy that, you know, he's, he's like a, what do you call, biomedical engineer. Do you understand? For me, that's like <laughs> rocket science. No, I'm not really able to have an intelligent conversation with you about that. But the Bible, we had a lot in common, just digging into the scriptures together. We tend to prioritize the immediate urges and appetites, even when doing so prevents us from receiving everything God has for us. See, I made some friendships, and I, I use the term loosely, it's only because in a two or three day period of time, you can't go like really, really deep. You know what I mean? But I made some friendships that I believe will go deep over time. Because we wanted to connect and we're, we're like, we're both in Christ and we wanted to connect. And so we connected. God wants that for us. You see, he wants more for us than we would naturally choose for ourselves. Remember the context, marriage, adultery. God wants so much more for us than we would naturally choose for ourselves. When I was a young Christian... In my early 30s, after having lived a fairly self-indulgent and promiscuous life, I, I was praying about how to discern whether or not to ask Elizabeth to marry me. We had met, and we'd begun to get to know each other just a little bit, my, my wife and I. And she was on a mission trip to Romania, and I know some of you have heard this story 30 times already, but, you know, suck it up, you're going to hear it one more time. She was in Romania, and, you know, I was involved in a, in a ministry that was focused on serving the fashion industry here in, in South Florida, which at that time was, was huge and, and booming. And, and so I was, I, was kind of, I was surrounded by these beautiful people, you know, beautiful girls. And, and, and so I found myself... With, I, I, had, I wanted to go buy Elizabeth an engagement ring, but I had doubts about it. Because I was just beginning to get to know her. I felt like the Lord was leading me to marry her. But I'm looking around, you know, I'm like, Lord, these are beautiful girls. They love you. How am I supposed to know for sure this is the right one? Because I've made some mistakes in the past, you understand? I'm, I was in my early 30s, so... I'd made some mistakes already. And I, in, my, in my old life, all I would have been focused on was the physical, basically. Is she pretty? Am I attracted to her? Do I, do I like her? Do, you know, is she fun to be around? Whatever. I mean, it, just the, the superficial stuff. And the, the Lord, I was leaving this girl's apartment. We'd been working on some, some uh, calendar events and stuff for the, for the ministry. And, and, and as I'm walking out, of her, you know, the sidewalk from the entrance to, to her apartment. I'm like, Lord, how do I know it's not her? How do I know? I don't know how to do this. What should I, what should I be focused on? I mean, really, what, how, and, and the Lord just spoke a question to my heart. It was just that quiet kind of response. Robert, who do you want to be old with? And it was 
profound. It clarified everything. Who do I want to be old with? Because, I, see, I always told those models, in 40 years, we're all going to look pretty much alike. Everybody's going to be wrinkled up. We're going to shrink. I've already lost like a half an inch of height. You know what I mean? We, we're all going to look alike. It's not going to matter. All the things that we, that we, you know, prize as young men and women, it's not going to be quite so important when we're in our 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I thought, that's Elizabeth's, the one I want to be old with. Why? Well, because I could see that our, the trajectory of our lives, it matches. Now, she came here for training thinking she was going on to work in Bogota, Colombia with a missionary, a Danish missionary there. So I don't mean that we were literally headed in the same direction. No, no. It, we were both pursuing God's best for our lives. And she knew that that full-time ministry, missions, just trusting God to provide, trusting God to protect, trusting God to lead, that was going to be her life, and that was my life. And I'm like, okay, that'll work. We're moving in the same general direction here. And she's pretty. Jackpot. And I like her. So it's like everything fell into place. Do you understand? See, I'm not suggesting that if there's no physical attraction, if there's, if there's no connection, you know, God's going to make you marry somebody you don't like and to whom you're not attracted. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the basis of the decision shouldn't be on those temporal superficial things that are going to fade away in just in a relatively short period of time. No, the decision that I made, it was, it was, it was a logical faith decision. In, in other words, I, I looked at the details. Okay, we're moving in the same direction. She loves Jesus, so do I. She wants to serve Jesus with her whole life, so do I. We're attracted to each other. We've already established that. There's, there is a physical attraction. There's, there's some sort of chemistry, emotional connection, whatever you want to call it. There's, you know, we like each other. If we commit ourselves to it, with Jesus at the center of it, this will work. You see that? So that's what we did, both of us. We both made a decision that was based on reason and faith, and not on romantic feelings. It wasn't just because, well, I love her. Because, you know, a lot of times we think that's enough, you know. The, and, and we don't stop to consider that what we're really talking about is just romantic emotion. Like that's somehow going to be enough. That's hot air. It goes and comes with the morning breeze. There's got to be something deeper than that. Last week at that conference, there was a couple that had been married more than 60 years. 60 years. Do you understand at that point in life... It, 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 it's about the deep things on the inside. It's not about the superficial stuff anymore. There's a deep connection between people that have been married for a long period of time. And so many people never get, to, they never get there. They, they never experience that kind of rich, lifelong oneness because they stay focused on the selfish, superficial, short-term satisfaction. It's It's natural. For a man to be attracted to a beautiful, accomplished woman. It's natural for a woman to be attracted to a handsome, accomplished man. But it can be deceptive. I remember my mentor telling me, he said, Robert, you do realize that doesn't go away just because you get married. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Just because you get married... You, you think that all of a sudden you go blind? You're no longer attracted to, to beautiful, likable women? It doesn't stop. As a matter of fact, he said, you know, you, you find yourself in a position at some point, maybe you and your wife had a fight that morning. Maybe it's the same fight you've had 45 times over the last year. And then some beautiful lady at work 
starts paying you compliments and telling you how awesome you are. And all of a sudden, you fall completely out of love with that old bat that's been bugging you for the last year. And now you're head over heels in love with this beautiful thing at work. And it's all about that deep. There's no foundation in that. It's a deception. It's a lie. Do you understand? Oh, it's real in the sense that you, the feelings can be overwhelming. But it'll wreck your life. It'll absolutely destroy you. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. God's plan for us is that we would commit ourselves to a spouse for a lifetime and then work diligently to serve that person, putting their needs, their interests above our own, putting the the health of the marriage up at the top of the list in terms of your concerns. Elizabeth's health and happiness should be more important to me than my own interests. I don't always get that right. I don't always get that right, but I try. Because that's the wisest way to live. I'm designed to lay my life down for her. Not not just in the sense of fighting off an attacker, in the sense of day by day choosing her before me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Laying down my life. Giving her first access to the shower. Or whatever. One of the best sermons that I've ever heard on the subject of decision making, speaking of choosing a spouse, choosing to commit yourself to a husband or or wife, but, but just in general on decision making, Um, said that once you've spent time seeking God's guidance, you know, step number one, crying out to God, God, I need you to guide me. I don't even know what to pray for, the Bible says. I need your guidance. I need your help. I need your wisdom. And, And then once you feel like you've gotten that, okay, I think, Lord, I think you're telling me this. I think you're showing me that. But I need to know. I need clarity. I need to know the what, when, where, how. I need to know all the details. I need clarity, Father. And I need converse, confirmation. I need to know that it's, that it's you. I need to be sure that it's you and not just me coming up with a good idea or the enemy trying to deceive me. I need to know that this is definitely what you want me to, to do, the choice you want me to make. He said, once you've gotten to that point, make the best decision you can make and murder the alternatives. That phrase has helped me so much over the years. Murder the alternatives, because it's, it's just such a, you know, in your face kind of a statement. Make a decision and murder the alternatives. Man, that is so good for young couples thinking about getting married. And if you already are married, even better. Murder the alternatives. You've made a choice. If I want God's best in my marriage, I have to give myself 100% to my wife, for my wife, to my marriage, and for my marriage. Comparisons to other people must not be allowed to occupy my mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the temptation, it's, it, it, it's, it, the temptation is going to be there. If only she could be more like, I heard a guy say that one time to his wife. If you just be more like my mom, oh, dude, you you may not wake up tomorrow morning. You realize you're going to be sleeping with that lady tonight? I mean, she's going to poison you in your sleep. You keep talking like that. Be like my mom. Man, grow up. She's not your mom. Comparisons. Again, it's natural, it's human nature, meaning that it's dumb. It's not the wisest thing to do. Don't make comparisons, not even in your own mind. 
make a choice, and then murder the alternatives. One of the most common things I deal with in marriage counseling is people threatening to leave, threatening divorce. I'm so grateful. As a, as a kid, one of the few things my dad shared with me, like, an, you know, insights into marriage. My mom and dad have been married, actually, July will be 60 years. One of the few things that he said to me, he, he said, I told your mama when we first got married, if you ever tell me I'm leaving, I'm going to pack your bag and you'll never be allowed back in the house. <laughs> and she knew he meant it. But he never said anything like that either. You see what I mean? And Elizabeth and I had that conversation before we married. I said, I will never cheat on you. And I will never leave you. Will you make that same commitment to me? That was before I gave her the ring. Seriously, I'm not giving her a diamond ring. Give her an engagement ring. And I don't know for sure she's committed to me. That she's willing to make that kind of commitment? No. I'm not going to bind myself to somebody who's not willing to bind herself to me. I needed to, is, I needed to know. What, what do you mean? Because we go into marriages, right? Because you guys, most of you already know. I mean, I was, I was married and divorced by the time I was 19 years old. I've committed adultery. I am, you don't need to hear all of my junk. But do you understand what I'm saying? I wanted to know. Is this, is this a serious commitment? Because we go into it a lot of times and we make these vows. Like, I, I, will, I will be faithful to you until I die, as long as you make me happy. As long as you're a good wife. We, in the back of our minds, we've got these little qualifiers, these little conditions. As long as you treat me right, I'll be faithful to you. As long as you make me happy. And we do this questionnaire. You know, I've got this lengthy questionnaire that we use just to find out what we need to be talking about in premarital classes. And one of the questions is along that line. Basically, the, basically the way it, it, it's worded is a statement that you can agree with or disagree with or, or you can be unsure about it. And, and basically what it says is, I believe that a husband and wife should stay together and fight for their marriage no matter how unhappy they become. And I get a lot of, I don't know, a lot of unsures. I don't know about that one. I'm not going to be miserable for the rest of my life. Nobody's asking you to be miserable. What we're asking you to do is fight for your marriage. That's what we're asking you to do. Make a decision. I'm not walking out. I'll fight for this. If it takes 20 years, I will fight for this. And then fight. Couples are going to fight. This, I'm doing a wedding on Saturday, and the girl, all the color, color drained out of the girl's face a, a few weeks ago, and, you know, because we're meeting together. And I'm like, you do realize that this is going to get ugly at some point. What do you mean? I mean, it's going to get ugly at some point. You put two imperfect people, you're going to be in the same bed, in the same house. You're going to be eating the meal, you know, breakfast and dinner, and it's going to get ugly. Sometimes it's going to get ugly. Right? All of you that are married, you know I'm right. It gets ugly at times. You have to fight for it. You have to work at it. The worst marriage I have ever seen, the couple never, ever fought. They had no relationship. They were like roommates who had been living in the same house for 30 years. Like almost 30 years. But they, they had no, no, no real life together, no intimacy, no relationship. You, you see what I mean? So they never fought. Healthy marriages, there are going to be disagreements. I had one couple tell me, I, you know, don't really want to call it a fight. Okay, don't call it a fight. At my house, it's a fight. <laughs> Every so often, but, but we fight fair. We fight well. In other words, we fight for the marriage. 
We're not fighting to harm the other person. We're not fighting to do damage to the marriage. We're fighting to resolve the differences, to build a stronger foundation. We have murdered the alternatives. I remember praying the prayers like, God, I am so miserable. And I don't want to live the rest of my life this way. And I know I can't go anywhere. I, I have committed myself to this. She has committed herself to this. So what do we do? And very quickly he gave answers. He gave us solutions. And we have a deep, wonderful marriage today. And we have had for 20 years. Do you understand? We fought for it. It gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah, God is good. You can applaud that. Because it sure wasn't me. God is good to us. Now, what about situations of abuse or, or neglect? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Two things. He will not require us to remain faithful to an unfaithful spouse. Ladies, if he's hitting you, leave. Gentlemen, if she's slapping you around, leave. Listen, the first two domestic violence calls, as I was riding along with Miami Beach police officers, it wasn't the guy beating on the lady, it was the lady beating on the man. Now, I don't know what it is about Miami Beach. Maybe it's just Miami Beach. I don't know, but I'm just saying it was that way. God does not require us to stay put and place ourselves in physical danger. Listen to me. Neither does he give us loopholes by which we can avoid true holiness. This is serious stuff for him. One of the things that's fascinating to me to look back, and, and I'm coming to a conclusion, I promise, but, but, but one of the things when you look back at the early church, you know what it was that marked the early church in pagan societies? It was this issue of morality. One man, one woman, sexual purity for life. There was no idolatry. They worshiped one God, and, and the men committed themselves to one woman. That, that was not normal in the ancient world. But they did it. In Matthew chapter 5, this passage that we've looked at, on adultery, Jesus confronted the tendency that we all have to rationalize our secret compromises. And we think that as long as we didn't have sex with them, just, you know, I mean, we, didn't, we didn't really have sex. So we're in a clear. Jesus says, no, you're not, because it's your heart God is looking at. It's your heart that needs to be transformed. He's looking at your heart. And there's not a one of us that can stand before him and say, I have a pure heart. I'm innocent. Now, remember, we discussed it in our Easter study. Jesus wasn't advocating self-mutilation. He was advocating self-examination. He was telling us, you know, not that you literally need to gouge your eye out. You still have another one to look around and get in trouble with. You know, cut off one hand. You still got another one that can be out there stealing stuff. That wasn't the point. The point was that nothing is more important than a pure heart. Nothing is more important than getting your heart right. And only he can cleanse it. He invites you to repent. In other words, turn away from whatever it is, turn to him and let him cleanse you, let him wash you. Admit your secret sin to God and begin thanking him for his mercy and his grace. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, we're closing with this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 
And so the, again, the invitation to get real with God, to repent, to ask him to do what only he can do to wash us and sanctify us and justify us in his presence. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this afternoon, we're aware of our guilt. We're aware that our hearts are stained, imperfect, that it's in our nature to give ourselves over to self-indulgence, to self-serving, gratifying the desires of the flesh, pursuing pleasure instead of pursuing you. It's in our nature to walk toward the darkness, but you call us into the light. You call us to come and, and be washed. You made a provision by sending Jesus to the cross to be executed, a provision for our rescue, our pardon, that, that we can be forgiven and have it all washed away and have our hearts, our lives transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit working inside us. I pray for these who are gathered here. Lord, we, we, we do have, we have such a tendency to make excuses, rationalize, pretend that, oh, it's just really not that big a deal when in fact it is. So Lord, I pray for each one here that you would shine the spotlight of your spirit down deep inside, if there's something that needs to be washed away. We ask you to cleanse us. We ask you to change us. I pray for the marriages that you would give every husband the courage to be the head of his household, to be the first one to surrender, the first one to die, the first one to choose selflessness, the first one to surrender rights and privileges for the sake of the family and the marriage. The leader in his home leading his children toward humility, strength of character, integrity. I pray for the, the wives and the moms that you give them the wisdom and the courage they need to submit themselves to the husbands who are trusting you and dying daily for their for their Lord and for their families. I pray for each of the wives that you would give them that gentle, quiet spirit that Peter wrote about. And for the single men and women, that you would give them the wisdom and the courage to trust you in their singleness and to be fully focused on you, serving you with their whole hearts and trusting you to direct their steps and guide them, to provide even the right spouse at the right time. Give them the assurance that you'd never let them miss something so important, that they don't need to be preoccupied with it, that they just need 
to trust you and take advantage of this season in which they don't have another person to focus on. They can just keep their eyes fixed on you. Give them discernment to recognize the one that you send for them to be old with. And Lord, I lift up to the ones that are here who, in reality, that they don't have the depth of relationship with you. They only know about you. They don't know you. I pray that right now you would reveal yourself to them. That right where they're seated, they would sense your presence and begin to hear your voice speaking quietly into their thoughts. Calling them to come and be changed and, and be forgiven. I want to ask you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just, just for another couple of minutes. I'm not going to drag this out. But I do want to give you an opportunity if, if right now you find yourself crying out to God, you recognize that, that you don't really know God like that. You, you, that you need a deeper relationship. You need His guidance. You need His help. You need to be washed. You need to be forgiven and you find yourself crying out to him I'd love to pray for you if that's you if you just raise your hand good awesome anybody else well, Father I thank you for these who have this afternoon recognized that they need your forgiveness and they need you to step in and do what only you can do recreate them on the inside transform them on the inside give them new life a purpose and a destiny I ask you to please fill them with your Holy Spirit and begin teaching them and give them, give them a hunger to open the scriptures and learn from you Make them sensitive to your Holy Spirit so that as they, as they read the words of Scripture, they, they begin to recognize your voice, talking to them from the pages of the book and speaking into their hearts instructions and giving them an awareness of how these things fit, how they apply in their day-to-day -day lives. Give them an excitement about talking to other people about your goodness and, and your love. Give them opportunities to do that and surround them with others who love you and who will faithfully walk beside them. Please bless them and protect them and provide for them. Father, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you raised your hand just now, as soon as this service concludes, the altar team is, is here. They'd love to pray with you, pray for you, and they've got a little free gift to give you as well. Uh, they're going to ask you to fill out a little information card for us so that we can continue to pray for you and lift you up. So please come see them as soon as the service ends. If you need prayer for something, you can come right now because we're going to close in worship, and they're here to pray for you. Would you stand?